Let's, let's begin. Today we're talking about geometric deep learning. This is a pretty new and uh, hot topic these days. And uh, we'll kind of uh, show it a bit and give a small uh, taste of it. We'll, uh, specifically, we'll cover how to do filtering on graphs and uh, show what graph Laplacians are and define a graph convolutional layer um, based on things that we that you, you have seen in the video lectures and we'll then uh, implement a small application example of uh, node classification in a graph, classifying nodes in a, in a given graph. Okay, so first let's uh, remind ourselves the, the required theory that we need for today's application. All right, so we, we've seen convolutional layers a lot in this course. And if you remember, a convolutional layer <coughs> operates on feature maps. The feature maps usually were 2D. Um, sometimes they can be 1D, as we already saw also. So you have uh, the, this feature map, and you have some filter, and you do a convolution between the filter and each feature map, and then you sum over the feature maps to create the output feature map. So in the case of images, we had these uh, 3D filters that were spatially local, and they were summing over all the input channels. So this is just another way to write it. And this uh, star operator denotes the convolution. So we, we like these uh, layers because of the, the advantages they provided. Namely, the, the number of parameters was, was small. It, is, it did not depend on the input dimensions. And there was parameter sharing, which is a useful property. And as we saw in CNNs, the output dimension changes um, based on the input. So today we'll, we'll kind of try to define something similar to these, these layers for uh, data that lives on graphs and does not live on, on uh, regular Euclidean uh, domains, so where this convolution operator is not valid. Okay, so let's just briefly remind ourselves what the uh, convolutions are. So uh, basically, if you want to convolve two functions, you sum the product of those functions. Um, well, the definition is that one of the functions should be flipped, and you, you sum them uh, pointwise. Basically, a small caveat here is that actually in uh, CNNs, the, the operation that they perform is, uh, is correlation, not convolution. They don't actually flip anything. But this is just the formal uh, definition of a convolution. And as you know, this is a linear operator, and any linear operator can be represented as a matrix multiplication. And um, specifically, the convolutions are represented as toplitz matrices, where the, these A, B, C, and these are the filter, uh, the filter uh, parameters. So you have this matrix which shifts the filter, and this represents uh, the convolution operator. If you take this matrix and multiply it by some uh, vector which represents a discrete function. Okay, and uh, it's shift equivariance, which means that if you provide a shifted input, your output will be shifted by the same amount. All right, so, um, so from linear algebra, we know this concept of uh, an eigen decomposition, which allows, it to, allows us to diagonalize a matrix. And an interesting property that we, we will use here is that all these toplets operators have the same eigen ve vectors, which is a useful property. And this, this is the basis, or these are the eigen vectors. You can define them like that. You, we define them using uh, these, uh, this notation of a discrete harmonic, which um, here we define on, on a discrete uh, spatial coordinate. So this, you can imagine this is just 1D. Okay? So this could be a 1D in space, and in, uh, in frequency, it's uh, continuous. Okay? So if you actually want to see that, that um, these are the eigen uh, eigenfunctions of the top of a topless operator. If you have some topless matrix, and you multiply it by this vector, so here this is, sorry. So this is a vector. We, we remove the n here. So this is a vector of all the n locations of this discrete harmonic. And we're looking at the nth output. And uh, since it's a topless, we can write it as a convolution, and then we just use the definition of the convolution, and since this is an exponent, you can split it. And basically what you get is, the, is this discrete harmonic times the inner product between your filter vector and that vector that you, you input here. Okay, so it shows that this is a, an, eigen, uh, an eigenvector of the matrix. Okay. 
Okay, so basically that's that's the the idea. So any any of these uh, discrete harmonics here again, this is a vector um, for all the n's in a specific frequency uh, c. So you get this uh, these eigenvectors eigenvalues. Sorry. Lambda. Okay, so we, we're going to need this property, and since this is a Fourier basis, we just can say this is also a Fourier transform if you take the inner product between some vector and this, sorry, again, between some vector and this, uh, and this eigenvector, okay, you get a coordinate rep which represents the coordinate of the Fourier transform. Okay, same for the inverse transform. Here the inner product is, uh, is an integral because the domain here is uh, continuous. So that's basically the idea, and uh, the useful property that we're going to need to define the graph, the graph convolution layer, layer with, which we'll implement later on, is the fact that if you have uh, a time, a convolution in the time domain, just exactly by using the definitions that I saw, that I showed in the previous slides, you can just plug this in, um, write it, write the convolution as a Toeplitz matrix times your vector, and then you can write this vector as a Fourier transform and then an inverse Fourier transform, so inner product here, and then the outer inner product on the continuous domain is the integral. And then you move the matrix inside, and then here you have the matrix times an eigenvector. So you get an eigenvalue of the matrix. Okay? And this actually, now in the frequency domain, this is an inner product between these two vectors and this vector. So. Basically, the, the point is that in the you can say time domain convolution is frequency domain multiplication between the representations. So this this is also known as the convolution theorem. This is what we'll use later on. This this yeah this is the top place. Yeah, we just write the we write these coefficients in the Toeplitz matrix, and then it's an operator that we can apply to a vector. OK, so let's talk about graphs. Um, so, so graphs are uh, generally enough to represent other non-Euclidean domains, like, like uh, point clouds or manifolds. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, domain to look at and see how we can represent functions on graphs and what we can do with them with uh, deep learning. So, I'm sure you, you, in your studies here, you've already seen lots of graphs, but we have this uh, graph defined by a vertex set, or also known as nodes. So you have n nodes here. You have edges between each two nodes, possibly. Um, generally, you have a vertex weight, so a weight for each of the vertices, represented as a diagonal matrix. And usually, what we care about is this uh, edge weight. So it's an adjacency matrix, which just gives you the weight between node i and node j where if they're not connected, then the weight is just zero. So you have a matrix representing the, the graph. And if you have uh, vertex weights, you have another matrix representing that. OK. So that's a graph. What, what is a signal on a graph? So uh, a vertex signal, just or a function on a graph, you, you just can define it as this vector. OK, so if you have n nodes, it's just a vector with n elements corresponding to the function to the value of the function at each of those nodes okay, that's it and we we can uh, define this uh, this uh, space with an inner product inner product space between two functions on uh, the graph again these are just vectors now if it's uh, since we're talking about the graph which is discrete and uh, the only difference is it's a regular inner product but we have to, we weight it by the by these um, vertex uh, weights Okay, so the important thing here is that we, the function on the graph is just a vector. Okay, and similarly, we can define a function on the edges, but it's not relevant for today. So, okay, so um, the next thing that we need for our uh, graph convolution network is the Laplacian of the graph. So Laplacian of the graph is an operator. You can apply it to a function on a graph, and you get another vector. So you apply it to one vector representing a function on the graph, and you get another vector. And uh, it's actually a measure of smoothness. It's, it tells you how, if you apply this Laplacian, what you get out is the measure of how smooth the function on the graph is, how quickly it changes between nodes, to, node to node. We're, we're, uh, we're talking about adjacent nodes. Okay. So um, formally, 
you, uh, you define it from, again, from uh, the space of uh, functions on nodes to space of functions on nodes. If you look at the Laplacian of some function on a graph at the point i, so the, at the i node, or the output of the Laplacian on f, looking at the i coordinate, what you see is, is basically it's a, it's a weighted difference where you take the value of the function at node i and subtract the weighted um, sum of the, f of the function value around node i. Yeah, the neighbors, direct neighbors. That's why that's what the j not equals i here means, and w i j is the adjacency. Okay, so it gives you the weighted sum of the function value between a node and all its neighbors. Yes. Okay. So again, if the function changes quickly from node to node, the Laplacian will have a high value. If it changes slowly from node to node, you have a low value. W. Yeah, W. It can be binary, that means the weights are all equal to 0 or 1, or it can be continuous. Yeah. Okay, so that's the Laplacian. And usually we rep it's an operator, we can represent it as a matrix, so if you have this Laplacian matrix, you just multiply this matrix by a vector representing a function on the graph, what you get is the output of the Laplacian for each node in the graph. So usually it's, this is how it's defined, d, d minus w in, with this uh, scaling. Okay, so there's lots of different the definitions which are similar for the Laplacian. So we're going to use one of the, one of the definitions that are, that's similar to that. The next thing that we need is uh, to take the graph Laplacian and look at its eigenvalues or vectors. Okay, so... Um, in the, so this is also an example, the, there's also a Laplacian in the, a regular Laplacian for, for functions in the Euclidean domain. And um, it's also a translation equivariant operator and also has a Fourier eigenbasis. So you can really see it easily if you just take this, uh, uh, this, this harmonic function, take its, uh, its uh, Laplacian just by definition, the sum of the second derivatives. And you can see you get the same function uh, scaled by this eigenvalue, okay? So, same idea now, just we have a Laplacian on a non-Euclidean domain, but we'll just do the same thing. We'll take the eigen decomposition of our Laplacian matrix and say that this is now a basis to represent functions on the graph, okay? That's the idea. So, the Laplacian uh, has an eigen decomposition. We'll write it as uh, this uh, phi matrix. Okay, so uh, this is the matrix with uh, eigenvectors in the columns, and uh, lambda is the diagonal matrix of uh, eigenvalues of the Laplacian matrix. Okay, and uh, if you have uh, so if you have uh, vertex weights, then then you have uh, a orthonormal, which which means that it's orthonormal if you put a here. Then you get i, but usually, usually in our example, we'll also ignore this a, and all our uh, edges will have the, all our nodes will have the same weight. Okay, so now we have an eigen decomposition. Let's look at what it means. So the the interesting thing is that these eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, or the eigenvectors in our case, which is discrete, are uh, are again they're functions on a graph. They have the vectors with n elements. And they represent the smoothest possible basis functions. So you can represent another function using um, a linear combination of these functions, and they represent a very smooth basis. So if you look, for example, at the Euclidean domain, the Fourier basis is these uh, signs. Okay, so you have uh, first a constant, and then a, a low frequency, and goes to higher frequencies. And if you look at the Laplacian eigenvectors of uh, of uh, other kinds of domains, like manifolds or uh, the graph which is a discretization of that. You can see kind of the first eigenfunction, which is a constant, and the second one is something that changes slowly. So as you go to higher eigenfunctions, or, or in the case of a graph, eigenvectors, it represents a function that changes quickly on the graph, higher frequencies. Okay. So again, we'll, we'll look at that soon. And again, since this is a basis for this space of functions on the graph, we can represent any function on the graph as a linear combination. So let's say I have some function on a graph. I can write it as a linear combination of my eigenvectors, and the coordinate, the 
the, the, the scalar that I need to, to multiply here is just you, computed by the projection, this inner product with, from, with, between my function and this eigenvector. Uh, okay, so this is basic linear algorithm. Okay, and uh, based on that, again, from uh, similarly, since uh, we, we said this is a Fourier basis, we can say that this is a Fourier transform if you take if you take uh, your function and transform it using these eigenvectors of the Laplacian. So you can define the Fourier transform and the backward Fourier transform this way. And now finally, with, with all of that, we can define a convolution layer for graphs. So we'll see two versions. One is the spectral version, which is directly based on this uh, definition. And we'll see that it has drawbacks, so we, we can't really implement it efficiently. And then we'll see the, the improved version, which we can implement, and then we'll implement it and look, see what happens. OK. So we saw the convolution theorem in the Euclidean case. If you take your uh, filter, toplitz matrix, you can say it's a convolution in, in time. OK, but in frequency, it's, uh, you, can, you can say it's, uh, in frequency, it's a multiplication. So this is just based on the definitions that we saw. OK, exactly, this is exactly derived from the definitions. Now, in the non-Euclidean domain, since our, our function is on a graph, we can't really move it around. It, does, it doesn't mean anything to shift it when we want to compute the convolution. Because, again, our function is just value, a value for each node on the graph. So there's no meaning. But, but, uh, but what we can say now is that instead of doing this uh, convolution part, we'll just skip it. Just skip this part of the equation. So we'll define the, this operator as um, the inverse Fourier transform of the multiplication in the frequency domain of, the, of our function. Okay, so we want to compute the convolution with this function, but what we'll do is we'll just skip this middle part and define it this way. And again, like we saw, we, have, we know how to compute this, this uh, Fourier transform based on the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. Okay, so now we can just define it like that directly, and we say this is the definition of convolution on a graph. This, we just define it this way. Okay. Here it, it was derived from our, our formulas, but here we just define it like that. And you can see that what you get is to, you get um, this uh, expression here. Just plug everything in. You, you take your f, you compute basically the inverse, the Fourier transform here by, by this multiplication. Then you, you, you apply a diagonal matrix, which represents the filter in the frequency domain. And then you do the inverse Fourier transform to get it back to the original domain. That's the interpretation here. So again, W is a diagonal matrix representing filter parameters. So since we're in a deep learning course, we'll want to learn the filter parameters. And this is basically the first definition of a graph CNN. Okay, so we can define the spectral version of a graph CNN this way. So now if we have our uh, features, so we have, um, now we have uh, M features for each vertex. Okay, so we'll think about it as, as feature maps. So you have, uh, for all of the nodes, you have M feature maps because you have M, M features for each node. So this is our uh, X, this is our feature maps. And the output should also be feature maps, but a different number of feature maps, just like a CNN where you take feature maps, do the, do the CNN layer, and then you get output feature maps. And we define it based on the previous slide formula. You take your input feature map, so this is a vector representing a function on a graph. You do this uh, sp spectral part where you do, take the Fourier transform, apply the filter, reverse Fourier transform. And then you get, uh, you, you sum it on all the feature maps to combine between feature maps, again, like a CNN. And then you get your output feature map. This is a jth feature map, yes. It's a vector. No, it, it's a vector of length n representing the value for each node. Okay. So let's say, so let's look at x. So x would be a matrix with uh, 1 to n here, and this is the first feature map, this is the second feature map. So I have m feature maps, okay? So this is a feature, feature map. Is not a feature map. So for, if you look at a specific node, 
then for a specific node, you have M features for that node. Okay. All right, so, but this actually is problematic. So if you remember from the lecture, um, Alex talked about this a bit. Why, why is this definition not actually very useful? Why is it not useful to define a CNN graph? So we have our data. It lives on a graph. We know what everything here represents. So this is the features on a graph. It's great, but why can't we actually use this? Anyone remembers? No, why, why is this not um, something that we, we would like to implement? What's the drawbacks? Uh, okay, so there, there's multiple drawbacks here. First of all, it's you have to compute this matrix multiplication with an n by n matrix twice, once here, once here. Second, the number of parameters. Remember, this is a diagonal matrix of length of uh, size n. So you have n parameters, and n is the number of nodes in your graph. Okay, so it's not like a convolutional layer where the number of parameters is fixed and not dependent on the spatial extent of the image. It's not, so it's not really very useful. And there's another issue with the fact that you're using um, the, the highest eigen um, vectors, which represent high frequency functions. So you, you, you might insert high frequencies. And the reason that that's, that's not um, very useful or less, less desired, if you recall from the lecture, Alex showed why there's this connection between um, smoothness in frequency and uh, spatial localization. So you, you will get non-spatially localized. So spatial localization in the graph means the operation is, operates on a node and, and it's uh, close neighbors. So you, you will not have uh, that. Okay, so these are the basic drawbacks of this method. Okay. So just uh, as an example, the last one, the last, last, uh, the last uh, drawback is also interesting. If these are learned parameters, they depend on this phi. They will depend on what exactly your phi was. And the phi depends on the graph structure because it's based on the adjacency matrix. So you will have a different phi for each graph. And uh, so another problem is that if you move to a different graph, your f learned filter will not generalize. Okay, so it's kind of hard to imagine, but here's a, here's a nice example that shows that. So let's say we have this uh, manifold. So, so, so it's a, like a, can think about this continuous version or a graph could be a discrete version of this. And you have some function f, which, re which is represented by the red parts here. So you have a function on a manifold. And uh, here you apply some uh, filter, w, on your uh, function. And in this case, it looks like an edge detection filter. You can see it really detects the edges of the function. But if you have a different manifold, which is actually not, not deformed, just, you just moved, moved the manifold, it's an isometry, then you have a completely different meaning of your filter now. So you, you applied here the same w, but you have a different phi. Okay? So uh, this would correspond to a graph where I changed the adjacency matrix. OK, so now let's finally define what we need for our application today, the spatial version of the convolution layer. So the spatial version is, as the name suggests, it's something that we want to do directly on the, the data in the spatial domain, like as it is on the nodes, without going through the Fourier transform and the back for it. Okay, so the way we do it is, uh, is this way. We, we define our, uh, our parameters. So this is, these are the n uh, parameters from our W matrix, our diagonal W matrix. As we define them as linear combinations of some functions of the eigenvalues va of the Laplacian, again. So now our parameters will be these, this, these Q parameters. Of course, we have a parameter for each input and output feature map, as usual in, in uh, every CNN case. And these uh, functions, be beta1 to beta q, are just some smooth functions. We'll see an example of polynomials, and there's lots of different kinds of polynomials that are used. OK, so now, because it's defined like that, the number of parameters does not, is not n anymore. It does not depend on n, the number of nodes. So how many parameters do we now have? Any ideas? How many parameters, learnable parameters, do we have? Q, but Q for every input and output feature map. 
So we have Q times M times M prime. So this is the input, let's say, and output feature us. You'll see it uh, based on the definition. And uh, the second thing is that if you take polynomials as these betas, then you can write it like, like this. Your W matrix, again, so the W, each W is a linear combination of the eigen, eigenvalues. So if, if your uh, beta is just a regular polynomial, then you have this uh, on the diagonal. Then you can move out the sum and you get something very nice. You get that it's uh, lambda to the k. And um, basically, since this lambda, this is an eigen decomposition of, of the Laplacian matrix, it's equivalent to taking the, the kth power of the Laplacian. Okay, so you take the eigen decomposition and take the diagonal part to the kth power. So now we have something interesting. So this whole Fourier apply filter and then inverse Fourier is, is uh, equivalent to multiplying by the powers of the Laplacian for this bit. It's a parameter, it's cor it corresponds to how you decide the filter size of your CNN. So it's a hyperparameter. You set Q as a hyperparameter. I guess it depends on the, f the domain and your problem. And finally, now this is the spatial definition of the Fourier CNN layer. So you can see now we have an, an input feature map. We multiply it by the Laplacian, or the kth power of the Laplacian. We do that for all the, the different k's using this alpha. And we have to sum over the input feature maps to combine the input feature maps and get one output feature map. Okay. So this is the definition that we'll use. And um, since the Laplacian, if you remember, represents a weighted sum of the function value between a node and its neighbors, you, it's, it's possible to show that the powers, let's say the Laplacian to the second power represents the, it's an operation that's local in, K, in a K ring. So it would represent the neighbors of the neighbors. So it, it depends on the value of, of the node and the value of the neighbors and the value of the neighbors' neighbors, but not anything beyond that. So this is a local operation. This is the, the power here of using Laplacian, and we'll see why this actually helps us solve our problem later on. Okay. And there's no uh, need to compute the eigen decomposition, and there's no need to multiply by the Fourier and the inverse Fourier matrices. Okay. So we'll write it a bit more generally, like like so, where we have x now again. This is our data representing um, the m feature maps of our input. And these, this beta is some function that will take polynomial. So there's lots of papers defining different betas. Um, and this is basically the final version that we're going to implement now. Okay. So let's go. Our application today, unless there's any questions about that, will be to um, classify nodes in a given graph in a semi-supervised way, which means we we we'll only have uh, the labels for uh, two specific nodes, and we'll try to classify the rest of the graph based on the connectivity and by implementing a graph convolutional layer. OK, so it's this uh, approach here that I'm showing is based on a paper by Keith and Welling from 2016. You can look at the paper. Um, we'll only have the true label for a tiny subset of the nodes, in this case, two nodes. And we'll try to classify all the nodes. OK, so let's start with uh, the data set. We'll use a toy data set, a very small graph known as the uh, Zachary's Karate Club graph. It's a network with uh, two communities, roughly communities, which will try to classify each node as belonging to one of the communities in the graph. And uh, this is uh, based on some paper, anthropology paper from the 70s, where the network, the graph shows um, 34 members of a karate club. And each node in the graph documents the fact that two people interacted outside the club. Okay, so they met each other maybe outside the club. And uh, at one point, a conflict arose between the administrator of the club and the instructor, the karate instructor. Um, so it led to a split of the club into two. So ha about half of the members formed a new karate club around the instructor. And uh, the other people, they just uh, quit. They g either gave up karate or they found a new instructor somewhere else. So basically, we have two things that happened to the people of, of this club. 
And we want to predict what happened to the person based on the, the fact whether they interacted outside the club before the split. All right, so let's uh, look at this. We have, um, I'm using this uh, library called Network X. It's, uh, it's a useful library for uh, working with graphs in Python, and this is a famous example, so they actually have this graph built in. Uh, looking at the data, I know the ID of the node representing the instructor and the ID of the node representing the administrator of the club. Okay, and this is, a, as you can see, a small graph, only 34 vertices and 78 edges. Let's visualize the graph. I'm using here again the, sorry, network X. So this is just uh, some code to visualize it. You can see this is the administrator node, this is the instructor node, and the rest of the nodes correspond to the members. So it's rough, it looks like roughly maybe there are two communities here in this graph, but not every node is, it's not obvious completely where the affiliation would go just by looking at it visually. Okay, so let's kind of uh, see what we, we can do with this uh, graph now. First of all, let's calculate its adjacency matrix. Um, just something I can do directly with this uh, library. And the degree matrix, which is just summing the, adja summing the adjacency um, column-wise, because it will tell you how, how, much, con how much connectivity, how, much, uh, how many nodes are connected to each node. And then the Laplacian, just by definition, d minus a, in this case. Okay, so let's calculate that. So as you can see, the adjacency matrix just, in this case, it's binary, you don't have weights. It just tells you whether, in this case, node uh, one is connected uh, to, to node uh, two. Um, and uh, Laplacian is uh, the degree minus, uh, minus a. So the fact that we have 16 here shows that the, this uh, node one has 16 neighbors. And uh, finally, we, we compute the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian, and we get the eigen uh, vec values and eigen vectors here. So phi would be our vectors, and this would be our values. And we can just plot the, the eigen uh, eigen values. This is the spectrum of the Laplacian. Okay, so just just to see what we're working with. Um, and another thing we can show is the the Fourier basis. Oh, it's like that. Wait. So here is, um, remember the, the phi is the, the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian. If we, we uh, color the nodes based on, so basically every column here is a function on a graph. It's, and remember that these are the smoothest functions. This is the smoothest basis. So if you color the graph according to the, the values of, of these functions, you should see that it's, it becomes less smooth as you go to higher eigenvalues. So again, smooth means the function value is changing quickly between nodes. You can kind of see it. It's, it's kind of hard because it's a very small graph. But you can see these uh, less smooth uh, functions here. OK, so that's, uh, that's nice. But let's actually start implementing. So uh, now each, uh, each node in the graph has this uh, extra attribute, club, which represents the member's post-split affiliation, or what what group he joined after the split in the club. So this will be our, uh, our labels, but again, we'll not use all the labels. We'll save them for test time, but we'll only train on the label of the instructor and the administrator. Okay? And uh, to just show that this is working based on the, the connectivity of the graph itself, we won't actually have any features here. So our, our, our matrix will just be an identity matrix. Our data matrix will just be an identity matrix. Okay? Which means that basically our only feature is the identity of the, of the node and we'll, we'll have to do all the predictions based on the connectivity of the graph. If we had extra information, we could, we could have encoded the extra information here. Alright, so here we just we create our uh, X. So this is our input matrix representing the, for each node, so each member each member, the features that we know about that member. The labels are just based on this uh, extra info. You can see there's, for the nodes we have this data, which is just, uh, just this uh, dictionary that tells you what the post-split affiliation is. So based on that, I'm just computing the labels. It should be 0 or 1. 
Zero means they uh, stayed with the instructor. One means they left uh, to a different instructor or left uh, karate. Okay. So in the paper, they use a normalized version of the graph Laplacian. So we'll, uh, we'll do the same thing. They define the Laplacian this way, where D is the adjacency, the, the, the degree matrix, and uh, A tilde is just A plus, plus I. Okay, so you can see instead of D minus A, they, they define it like that. Based on the degree. So this is one way to define Laplacian. It's, it's a valid uh, definition. And if you look at the, the elements of this Laplacian, it's basically the, the adjacency normalized by the degree, the product of the degree. Okay? And uh, since we added i, we have these uh, self-loops. And uh, the, the, what's, the, what's the point of having these self-loops now? If we, if we would have defined it, the Laplacian this way, without adding this i, what would happen? Try to imagine what Laplacian is doing. Remember, it's local. It's a local operation. Okay, so basically, if, if we wouldn't add, add this i and define it like that, then it would not allow the output features of a node to depend on the value of the node. Okay, so the fact that we, we add this, we can, uh, we can also depend on the, the actual value of the node, not just its neighbors. Okay, so this is just the way they define it. They, they add, add i and then normalize it this way. Okay, and the model in the paper is defined um, in, this, in this way. So for layer L, what they do is they, they have this, this uh, input feature maps for the layer L multiplied by the Laplacian, okay, and then weighted by this uh, output matrix to calculate the output feature maps. So, so the inputs are uh, N by M. So this is the M is the input number of feature maps. And uh, M prime is the output number of feature maps. So again, think about this for a second. What, what does it mean? What's going on here? Any ideas? Think about this part and this part separately. So, so this part is the Laplacian times the feature maps. So remember that the, the Laplacian is a local operation. It takes the value of a node, weighted sum with its neighbors. So what this part is doing, it's it's combining local features in the same feature map. Okay, and the, the second part, the W, is transforming across multiple feature maps and combining them to, to the output feature maps. Like in, like in a regular CNN, where the output depends on all the input feature maps. You have, a, you have a spatial region and you look at all the channels. Okay, so you always look at all the channels. So this is exactly what's going on here. Th this ensures your you're, you're using the, the information locally, and then this allows you to do the linear combination to combine different feature maps to get an output. So this is the definition. Now I'm just implementing the, the adjacency matrix and adding this i and defining the Laplacian based on their definition. So it's uh, d to the minus half times a times d to the minus half. Okay, so this is just what's going on here. This is the Laplacian definition from the paper. The model is a, a graph convolutional network based on the spatial version that we saw in the beginning. And uh, we'll compute simple powers of the Laplacian. So we'll take beta as just regular polynomial functions. Okay. So if you want to visualize, then um, we'll have a model with two graph convolutional layers. Each layer takes a, a tensor with C in, C in features for each node and, and gives you C out features. So, so you have a graph. Each node has C features, which is represented here by this, uh, these uh, rectangles. So again, for each node, I have some number of features. I'm applying my graph convolution layer, and I'm getting a different number of features, M prime. Okay, and finally, I will have labels for two nodes which I will use to compute the loss only from those two nodes, and then backprop through that. So this shows the, the idea and the, the way that we're going to train. OK, so again, remember the definition of the spatial uh, GCN. We have a feature map. We apply uh, the Laplacian to some power. And then we weight it using the weight matrix. 
Okay, so this is uh, this already represents all the output feature maps, and this represents all the input feature maps. Okay, and we'll implement it with a simple case of the beta k is just equal to lambda to the k. So let's look at the implementation. Finally, we have some, some code. The GCN layer takes the graph Laplacian. So this, for us, the graph Laplacian, this just represents the graph. This is all the information that we need to know about the graph. Input number of features, output number of features for this layer, and max deg is the, max, the q. It's like q, it's the maximal uh, degree of the polynomials that we will use. So remember, we need to sum over these, uh, these q's. We have, to, we, have to, we have to sum until q, as you remember from here. So this alpha k is uh, just a linear layer, just a regular linear layer, and the last one should have a bias also. So we'll have uh, fc fully connected layers, so each fc layer is like uh, the alpha k matrix. Okay, so we just create these uh, FCs from input features uh, to output features with uh, the last one having a bias. And we'll also pre-calculate the, the beta k of the Laplacian. So we have this uh, function here, taking the Laplacian, and we'll just, uh, just calculate the Laplacian times itself to get the, the powers of the Laplacian and just save it. In the, in the forward pass, we just directly implement the formula that you saw. So we take x, which, re which represents the feature maps for each node. Um, okay, and we, we just go over our, uh, our uh, fully connected layers and k. We take the kth power of the Laplacian, multiply it by x, okay, and then apply a fully connected layer. This is the multiplication with alpha where the last one has a bias, so you'll get the bias here, and then we sum them. That's it. Oh, finally, also we have a, a non-linearity, which can be anything. And that's it, that's the basically one graph convolutional layer, the spatial version. Implement it, again, based on the given Laplacian for a given graph. Okay. So in our problem, Again, we have this x that we, we created before using an identity matrix. So the number of input features is the number of columns in x. The number of output features is 2, because we're, we're trying to predict whether the nodes belong to class 1 or class, class 0 or class 1. This is the post-split affiliation, so we have two output features. Um, the graph Laplacian, we calculated it before based on the definition in the paper, so just creating a tensor will uh, define the maximal polynomial degree as 2, so we'll take uh, powers of 2 of the Laplacian. And another, hi hidden another uh, hyperparameter we have is the hidden dimension. So for no good reason, we'll just use 10, so this would be the, the embedding, let's say. After the first convolutional layer, we have, for each node, we'll have 10 features representing the embedding of that node, based on the GCN. So finally, the model will just be two GCN layers stacked. So the first GCN layer from input features to the hidden dimension, the second from the hidden dimension to the output features, and finally we have log softmax to calculate log probabilities of these two outputs for each node. Okay. Great, so that's our model. Let's train it. So, like I said, it's a simple classification task with the only thing, the only nuance is that we have Labels for only two specific nodes, which are fixed. We don't sample. We don't sample data. We don't have batching. We only have specific two nodes with labels, and we'll only apply the backprop to them. So, this is our uh, training function. Um, so x is the x is the input data, and y is the labels for all the nodes. Okay. We do the forward pass through our model. So this goes through the two GCN layers, and finally we get y pred, which is an n by two uh, tensor. I'm saving them. I'm saving them for later. I'll show you a visualization. But what, as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm just taking the index of the administrator and the index of the instructor. I'm taking taking the prediction only on those two indexes, and the classification, and the actual ground truth labels only on those two indexes, and calculating the loss only based on those two nodes. 
Okay, so that's my loss, and then just backward through that loss. Let's train. So again, this is a really small problem, toy data set. It's really quick. You can see the loss is going down. But is this actually meaningful? I mean, so the loss is going down, but we, we might be overfitting like mad on those two nodes. The only thing that we're checking here is whether we, 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 our loss is low for those two nodes. Okay, so it might not mean anything. But let's look at the accuracy for all nodes now. So after we trained, let's take all the data, okay? Um, for it, pass it through our model. Take the maximal, uh, take the arg max to get the maximal uh, probability as our prediction, and and compare it to the ground truth. And uh, we can see that we actually got very good accuracy. Actually, we, we only got one, one member wrong, okay? So it's interesting, but the question is, was this maybe too easy? I mean, it was really easy. We just got really good accuracy. Maybe, maybe it doesn't mean anything. Maybe the graph, the whole graph thing, that didn't really com contribute anything to this result. So uh, to check that, let's do another quick uh, test. We'll compare it with an MLP, which will take the same input, the same input features, and uh, calculate, again, the, the probability of each class. So th this model is really the same thing from input features to some hidden, em hidden embedding dimension. But using just regular layers, we don't use the graph Laplacian here. We don't have any idea that there's a graph. We're just taking features and, and transforming them using an MLP. OK, if we, if we train that using the same training function, just different model now, you can see, um, sorry. You can see we actually got uh, very, very bad results. If we run it a few times, you can see it kind of looks like a random guess, basically. It's not learning anything. So it doesn't work to just do that blindly. Something really went on here. So the question is, why, why, does, why does it work? Why do you think the, the GCN was able to actually learn something relevant? The fact that we... Instead of just using linear layers, we added the graph Laplacian in there. Okay, and then we trained on those two nodes. Compared to the, the case where we just used linear layers and again, trained on those two nodes. So what do you think is going on here? Why is it working? Okay. Exactly. So what the relationship between the nodes are captured by the Laplacian. And when we backprop through those two nodes, the fact that the Laplacian is in there is forcing the embeddings to be dependent on the neighbor's embeddings. It's kind of that, that's kind of the intuitive way to think about it. Okay, so we basically when, when we backprop th through those two nodes which we had labeled the administrator and the instructor. We, we force the model to, to give more meaningful embeddings to their neighbors. And we also use the neighbors of the neighbors because we had a second uh, degree polynomial there. So it kind of makes, makes sense that we got a better, a better result. And we really we, we added extra information. We encoded the graph using this Laplacian. And we had more information, which led to a much better result in this case. OK, and finally, just to, to conclude, let's see a, a visualiza visualization. So I'm just, um, this is just uh, creating a, a, a plot at each time step during training based on the prediction that we saw before. Um, okay, so what I'm showing you here is I'm, uh, I'm uh, drawing the graph and I'm positioning each node according to the, the, the log softmax score that it got. So the position in the, in the figure of each node is uh, the coordinates is, are just the log softmax score, the zero and the one elements of that node. And uh, the colors are uh, the class, um, or the class. So um, you can see the, the purple ones mean that it's uh, incorrectly classified. So you can see initially, initially many are correctly class in incorrectly, but and then there's these two that are incorrectly, and after after a few more epochs, we're left with just one. So it can really kind of uh, split this graph nicely based on the structure that was encoded only by the Laplacian. Okay, so again, this is a toy example.
but it kind of shows you uh, an implementation of a spatial version of a GCN and uh, an application for classifying nodes in a given graph. So pretty cool. Thanks.